basically, yes, Nuno was saying, I'm not going to talk about exactly what I do every day at work, um, but it sort of was birthed from what I do at work. So I work at Twilio on this project called Client, which is uh, a, it's an in-browser library uh, you can use to make phone calls to Twilio. So we use a lot of Flash, um, and you know, if you've ever used Flash, you know that you need to like worry about you know how to load it and you know embed it into the DOM and things like that. Um, so I was doing a lot of I was doing a lot of like callback um, related stuff where I would wait for the body to load and then I would load Flash and then anyway it's just boring stuff. So. But it sort of got me thinking about, um, oh god, what just happened? It sort of got me thinking about um, how, to, how to compose things together that are asynchronous. So if, you've haven't, um, if you haven't gotten familiar with point-free programming, does, does anyone know what that means, point-free programming? OK, everyone does. For of us. Um, I'm going to give you like just a little uh, visualization. So I see a lot of code where it's like, uh, you know, it, it, jQuery's promises they do this where you sort of call like, I don't know, get or something, some URL, and then um, when it's done, you want to run some function that will handle it, I guess. So I see a lot of code like this, where um, do stuff with res. Wow, that's. And then, and then on an error, so I, I'll see stuff like this, right? So we want to log this error, and we end up calling log error, right? But why do we do that when, I mean, um, a good alternative is just to pass log in here, right? So that error, this, this, this thing here, that's, that's the point. And when you take it away, um, it's called point free. So it's just a way of like smushing, uh, composing uh, functions together in a way that you're not sort of manipulating the variables um, in the intermediate layer. So that's point free. I hope that, I hope that made sense. So as I was saying, I was thinking a lot about asynchronous functions. And whoop, can I make this full screen? I was thinking a lot about asynchronous functions. And so we all know what they look like. Um, they take a callback. And when that function does whatever it was meant to do and it finishes, then the callback gets called back. And when you have two asynchronous functions, you end up having to nest them, the second one inside the first callback. And if you want to sequence yet another function, it gets deeper and deeper. Does anyone write code like this, or is it just me? <laughs> just me. And, and some of the... Um, Top guys over here do that too, so you see it's a commonality. So some people uh, like to name each callback, and this avoids nesting them, and maybe it's easy to read, I don't know. But um, notice that when you do this, if you have anything useful inside the logic of the callback and you want to reuse it somehow, you, you can't anymore because it's now tied to the implicit next computation. So for example, if if I wanted to drop it and then lock it, like I would need to pass the second callback into pop it and then and then it would it would actually call pop it first i don't I don't know you know it's 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 not i don't think it's a great way to compose things like that, but um it does definitely make things more readable. One other thing too is that if you code like this i mean. Where, who catches these thrown exceptions? 
we have to handle them basically there or nowhere at all. If we wanted to, if we wanted to catch all the exceptions in a single place, that's impossible. So, um, oh, one one more thing to notice is how do you retry? Um, how do you retry one of these things? It's it's not like there's any sort of um, construct to say if if lock it errored out, then you know retry that lock it again. So. Anyway, um, I was thinking about all these things, and there are lots of control flow libraries out there that that kind of uh, they focus on this too. In fact, if I can just drag this over, oh, that's not it. Like, I think there are like a bajillion control flow libraries for JavaScript. And they, they might all be really good. Um, I, I haven't had a look at all of them. But the three uh, that I have looked at, actually, let's just click on one of them, see what the first one is. Where is this pretty syntax they talk about? Yeah. Yeah, they look sort of all the same. So one, one actually cool thing that I have seen is, actually, I'll get to that later. Um, but. Anyway, as you can see, there are lots of these control flow libraries. And yes, I made another one because I just I do that. So, but we'll, we'll, we'll have a look at the ones that um, are already um, uh, sort of in, in distribution. So what we have here is uh, promises. It returns an object, like a deferred object. You can call it then, then. And it sort of sequences pop it, lock it, drop it, and then it if there's an error, you we log it. And done basically completes the computation. Async does something the same something similar. Ha has anyone used any of these? Are they good? Like how do they help? So all right. So yeah, so these things are helpful. Um step has uh you can parallelize things. I think the other ones might you can do that too, but um this is how you do it in step. So you can see the commonality between these three libraries and Doubtless, many more. Uh, they share a similar API, um, but I think none of them quite look like synchronous code. So this is where I started experimenting. So this is what it would look like if if every method blocked, and you know we didn't care about it blocking. Um, so I was wondering how close can we get in JavaScript to the look and feel of a synchronous function but still be using asynchronous functions underneath the covers um, and also be able to you know catch exceptions and things like that so this is where <laughs> this is where it gets a little crazy so um, back to this so if you could just sort of focus on what are the most important tokens uh, in, in in this piece of code and you can take away the syntax of assignment, um, and you get well basically what we need: um, the name of the variable, the function that we're calling, and some parameter. And if we replace it with new assignment constructs, and these can be used to invoke asynchronous functions underneath the covers. So I'm wondering: is this API similar looking enough? Um, we can actually. Name this computation, do that thing, and call it and catch exceptions that are thrown in it. And this is something that's interesting to me. So, and as I was saying, this is just an experiment, but um, in how, uh, how we can maybe transform JavaScript to look like synchronous code, but still be performing asynchronous functions underneath the covers. And so, as I started this, I realized like looping, how are we going to do that? And that's actually the um, implementation of the loop under there. So if you can think of each asynchronous function as having a head and a tail, and the tail gets to plug into any other asynchronous function. And what we're doing here with that bind is we're plugging the head. Uh, we're taking m and plugging the tail into m again um, into itself. So that's how we loop forever on this computation. Um, you can also do conditional looping. So as you can see, it's like really quite messy. Um, 
we have to inject uh, some, uh, well, we're checking the condition of x and looping if, if it's under a certain number. But what's possible is we can hide all of that complexity inside another function. And if you're willing to hide complexity, then you can actually get this looking kind of clean. Um, so what, what does it actually do? What does that API do underneath the covers? Um, so cont do, that notation is just, it's a coroutine. You keep passing in, uh, you keep passing in computations and close it with uh, by passing in nothing. And it's exactly the same as calling bind on x and y. And um, you can keep on calling them. And it's actually a fold um, over those computations uh, with, with bind. Is everyone following? Some people's jaws are hanging. Um, so what is bind, really? It's just a, it takes two things, and then it wraps it up in a certain context, which is the function that accepts k. Um, you can have a look at this later. Uh, return wraps it up in a context, takes an x, and wraps it up in a function that takes k. Uh, so I was showing you um, continuations, but this pattern can also be applied to um, lists, too. So if we see the return function of this continuation class, or whatever, um, you see that it's taking an x and putting it in something. And it's the same thing with a list. It takes an x and it puts it in the context of the list. So let's see. Should we try to code it up from scratch? How much time do I have? 20, 12, probably not that much time. But I will show you, let's see. Uh, turn on Mary. I'll show you like how to maybe do like a drag and drop demo with this, which is like pretty, pretty um, straightforward, if I can find it. I had JS Fiddle open up somewhere. JS Plum. Actually, what's really cool is like if you take something like JS Plum, if you've worked with this library, and you think of each of these um, pipes as you know the, the the composition, and you can, I wonder if you can you can take these two libraries and smush them together and create some sort of like visual programming language, which is actually what I wanted to try to demo, but I didn't get around to it. But you can see that th maybe these are functions, and maybe this is like a transformer. I don't know. Just thought it was something cool. So, oh, this is not the right window. How's everyone doing? So far, so good. Is this interesting? All right. You've got a lot of Haskell inspired talks today. You guys are a lucky crowd. So, I wanted to code this up from scratch, but I don't. I don't think I quite feel up to it. Um, so I will. I will just go through this code with you to ensure that it, it does in fact work. Um, I think I did something wrong. So I can drag around the square, but how is that done, right? So we want to find that out. Drag this thing over. So the entire. So if we can add it, we can add. You know you. You must be familiar with this code. We're just adding the element to the DOM. Nothing fancy there. But what is this under here? So we're calling drag drop on this element. And basically, drag drop is a behavior that we're going to like um, combine with this element, right? And don't worry about that empty function down there. I'll explain it in a bit. But if you can see drag drop is very, it's quite simple. Um, it takes the element. And it constructs a continuation, a computation, uh, that involves first calling, uh, registering a mouse down event listener on this element. And then when that ever happens, uh, we assign it to down E. Then we register. 
Um, we register callbacks for, I mean, event handlers for uh, the mouse move events and the mouse up event. And depending on uh, when one of those gets called, uh, we call move or cancel with E and down E. So if you think about what needs to happen here, um, I could just show you the code actually and you won't need to think about what happens. But <laughs> because I'm, I'm having trouble following it sometimes too. So mouse down is, is pretty simple. It takes, uh, we're constructing a continuation and uh, it listens for one, a single mouse down event and then it removes itself. Um, you can see this handler just, we, we, uh, we reference it inside of itself and remove it. So what ends up happening is you can think of this thing as emitting just like one event, like a single mouse down event. And when that goes down the chain, it, it hits um, register, and register adds a mouse move and a mouse up event to the window, and its handler then just calls k, whatever k is. So k in this case is move or cancel. And you see that we've wrapped up the, uh, what we're injecting into k is the mouse move or the mouse up event and the handler itself. So this is how we can cancel um, the entire computation uh, by pushing handler into the, uh, remove event listener, which is down here. So, um, and then it calls update, and update is like, you know, it's, it's just updating CSS styles. And you, you get, you, you know, you get this composition. This is another way to do drag and drop. I, you've probably tried to, uh, you've probably done your own drag and drop stuff before, and I don't know how it looked like, but. This is another way to think about it. Um, it's not actually working anymore. Anyway, so the last thing I want to just show you is that uh, I, I promised you that lists also work the same way. And if um, I had this morning, I had the inspiration <laughs> to go onto the Haskell wiki and try to basically uh, convert um, a parser from scratch. So it's an it's a parser for an abstract, uh, an, an, ambigu um, an ambiguous grammar that accepts uh, hex digits, uh, digits, and just alphabets. So you can see um, what we've got here is we've got certain parsers, um, but at the end, it's just a bind. Uh, and um, it, it's folding parse over uh, every the string that we give it here. So. If I run this, it will, it should parse into, I don't know, we'll see what comes out. So hex and a word. So I think that's, that's really it. I hope you guys enjoyed this. Um, just some ideas to have while you guys do your own computations and try to figure out better ways to go about um, things that you do at work that may be pretty boring, but Anyway, hope you like it. Thanks.